Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the colloquium. It's, it's a real pleasure to have Bob Kava here uh, from a small university in New Jersey. <laughs> He's a solid state chemist par excellence. That means we judge all solid state chemists by him and really amazing, uh, really amazing work. He's the Russell uh, Wellman Moore Professor of Chemistry at Princeton University. And he's really the main driver of research in what are called quantum materials. So quantum materials are materials where you can't treat the electrons independently, but you have to take into account correlations, where density functional theory fails, and where you get interesting new phenomena, phases, etc. cetera. Um, amazing number of papers, important papers, uh, collaborates with almost everybody in the field except maybe Aaron Kapitulnik, and, and he's, the, he's a fellow of the American Institute of Physics, the American Physical Society. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He has many, many, many awards. Perhaps most importantly, he's a New Yorker, so it's nice to welcome you back. And you like working with weirdos, right? Yeah. <laughs> so welcome. I look forward to your talk. Well, so thanks for the introduction. So it's great to be here. And as you can tell, I've been around a bit, so I'm been involved in a lot of things in my life and it's been a lot of fun so um, today we're going to talk about my some things I could there's lots of things I could talk about but I think that this is designed to be hopefully a multiple multidisciplinary talk and uh, we'll see how it goes but basically I was lucky because I liked rocks and metals from the time I was little so I could I have a very distinctly chemical view of the world, but I, but I also like physicists. So and that's an unusual combination. So I had a lot of things to do with physicists. Let's see. Here. Well, there's there's some of my students right there. So we'll, we'll see, especially Jason and Reden's work here in this talk. That's a Lublis Seibel right there, and she she did some good stuff with uh, gold. Gold being one of my favorite elements in the periodic table. It's an odd one. So let's see what happens. Oh, this this is this is a picture of me. So this is what my students think of me. I'm like the, the killer, the guy who makes sure that they behave themselves. So and rule number one is to kick butt. So there is the somebody kicking somebody's butt over there. And uh, so what we do in solid state chemistry is we use a distinctly chemical view of the world to make things that hopefully physicists will find interesting. So that's that's the, the difference between me and, a, and an ordinary chemist is that I care about what about reaching out to that other community. So this is my playground. So this so I think the if there's any message in this talk, it's going to be that this this thing, which somebody invented more than a hundred years ago, is got holds a key to a lot of a lot of, lot of science. So each, each one of these things is like each one of you. You have personalities, and each element also has a personality. So maybe maybe uh, you take this thing for granted, but it's not something I take for granted at all. And so each one of these elements is different. Even the ones next to each other are different. So, you know, that difference makes a big difference. And um, so we just have to know what to do. And I think... What I like to do is to ask physicists what it is that's on their mind. What would you like to see the world invent? What would you like to what, what would you like to work on? So, if you if you think of something to work on, then tell me. And it might take years for me to figure out how to make a material that illustrates it, but it might happen eventually. So, this this, this is my playground, this periodic table, and it's color coded in different ways. And I think I. Yeah, I have this thing. So I, one of my, I have, you'll discover you have personal prejudices in life, and I have some, like I think gold is an interesting element, but I also think that EFT is an annoying thing. In <laughs> chemistry departments, people do it all the time. So I, and I think that if you want to get a- Who is DFT? <laughs> that, that density functional theory. So what is it? I don't even know what it is. Oh, uh, more or less. Okay. So, good. <laughs> so you, don't have to go, you don't have to have that in your papers to get them published. So there's an interesting thing going on. Right now there's a automatic do it or don't do it and don't get your papers in journals. 
or do it and get the papers in a journal. And then, but basically it's a classical problem in physics. I think it's called a three body problem. Or if you have two electrons that are interacting with each other, how do you describe the way two electrons interact with each other and how they interact with the nucleus at the same time? It's not, so you have to make approximations to do that. And what is the approximation that is typically used to explain how elements in the periodic table work? Actually, is it right all the time or not? And maybe what's interesting to me is when it doesn't work. So you get, you get to pick in your career what, what you want to work on, things that, that you're going to understand or things that you don't understand. You'll discover that I just don't understand everything that I work on, and I don't, I don't, that doesn't bother me. So, so this, this is something I hand out to all my students when they first come. It says, don't use elements in red without boss permission. I'm the <laughs> boss. So they're not allowed to use the ones that are poisonous or otherwise bad, like arsenic, cadmium, mercury, osmium. Technetium is radioactive. Beryllium is bad. I don't know why beryllium is a, is a, is bad. It must substitute for something in the human body. So that's not good. But arsenic is a known poison. By the way, we don't use arsenic. We'll see something with arsenic in it later. But, so anyway, these are the common oxidation states. So if you heat something in air, it's like, what do you get? Like, why, why are oxides so common in the world? It's because oxygen is one of the most common elements in, in the, on Earth. So you breathe oxygen, you use oxygen to survive, but rocks need oxygen to make, to make minerals. And so mineralogy is all about what you get when you, com when you co combine things in the periodic table with oxygen. Um, so for me, the interesting part of the periodic table is the middle part. And I want these things to be in an oxidation state that's different from what's on this table. So these are what you get when you're in the air. And that means that they emptied all their valence or all their valence electrons are somewhere else. So if you make it, if you make it something from the middle of the periodic table and it has one of these oxidation states, that means it gave all its electrons that it had to give to something already. So the, for me, that's not interesting. So I guess you, you can look at this column right here. So copper, silver, gold. So gold, gold is a noble metal. Why is gold called a noble metal? Because it doesn't give up electrons to anything, but you can mess with gold anyway. So gold is entertaining. And mercury is another one that it's like a metal at room temperature. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, what do you do in solid state chemistry? Maybe you have an idea that you got for something to make from by talking to a physicist. Then you have to figure out how to make it. And how you make it can sometimes, that's the thing that's hard to explain to people. It just takes forever to figure out how to make something. And that's where the trick, I mean, you can, first of all, you have to have a good idea about what to make, and then you have to figure out how to make it. And what it's exactly not so, is solid state chemistry? Say what? You said solid state chemistry. What does it mean? So solid, solid state means that... Solid well, state, I know. It's like, like a mineral is a solid state chemistry, or a mineral is a, like a solid, and a rock, a, a chunk of metal is a solid. So you, there are different definitions for solid state chemistry, but basically the way you should think about it is there's no identifiable molecule where you can say that there's strong bonding in one spot and then such weak bonding somewhere else that you could draw a circle around something and say that this, this part is my fundamental building block. It, it, they repeat to fill space. So basically, solid state chemistry is about ke the chemistry of solids. How do solids work? Like not non-molecular, not molecular chemistry. So molecules can be solids too if they're heavy enough or if you can get some kind of weak bonding. But Solid state chemistry is like, like uh, what's, the, what's the difference between a BCC body center cubic metal and a face center cubic metal? Do you know why they form, why they don't form? Or you don't. So that's solid state chemistry. And like, why, does, why, does, uh, why does garnet form as a mineral? Like, and why does uh, pyroxene form? So why do these things work? Because because metals can share oxygens with other metals, I mean, to put it simply, and everything's in a normal oxidation state like there'd be in the air. So all the valence electrons are gone or used up. So I, I think that's a good question. What, what is salt state chemistry? That's, that's a good question to ask everybody. 
What is it? It's just the chemistry of solids, but there's more to it than that because wax is a solid. Hmm. So are you aware of the fact that zinc sulfide can have different different colors depending on how you make it? So zinc so not only is it how what is zinc sulfide, CNS, but CNS just melted zinc zinc sulfide looks like that and transported zinc sulfide looks like that. So where did this color come from? That color came from some defect that got into the zinc sulfide. So not only does it matter what you make, but it matters how you make it. So uh, transport properties of matter can be, or the properties of matter you get out of a transported material can be different from the properties you get out of a melted material. Yes, some pictures. So we use simple oxides and things that come in bottles. You buy them, so you can buy them. You can buy stuff, but how you combine it is what's interesting. And how what you actually do to actually make it. So because there are two messages here. One is that because the reactions are typically between solids, they need they take temperature to make them work. So temperature, so you need to get two atoms to react with each other. So, or three or four or five atoms to react. How do you do that? Well, the way you do it typically is, the way solid state chemists would do it is you would heat them up and get interdiffusion, diffusion of one species one way and the other species the other way. Then when they get in proximity to each other, they might form a chemical bond, and they'll lower their energy by making that chemical bond. And so that so we we use temperature all the time to do this. And I think part of the trick in solid state chemistry is knowing what temperature you have to heat something to to get it to work. So basically, we have two. We have, I spent a lot of time talking to the thin film people while I was here. You can actually defeat thermodynamics by doing thin film work, but I live in a world where thermodynamics rules most of the time. So a lot of the tricks we have is figuring out what the equilibrium phase diagram of something is, and then getting the substance that we're trying to make to work under the conditions of equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, where it the combination of, of simpler things will give you something that's more complex. I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately. But we use heat, and this is an example of uh, how you don't know what you have to explain to people. So basically, this is this is these are little furnaces right here. They go to a few hundred degrees. I think I have just examples of things that got hotter. So uh, the hotter things get, the bigger the furnaces get. So basically, it's so that you don't burn yourself when you're putting something in there. And there's a really high temperature furnace. So it's a kid's finger. Like I just heated something in there, and so this. This is a ceramic fire brick that's over here. And then this, this is called the Hulk. So my students, if they invent, if they put something together, they get to name it. So the Hulk is a high temperature vacuum furnace. That means some, some things can't be heated to high temperature without reacting with air. So this is heating in air. This is not heating in air. So suppose I want to control the oxidation state of some element, like how many electrons it gives up in a chemical bond. I can do that. I can do that by making it go into equilibrium with some gas that it, that a gas that is is confined, or or I can do it in air if I'm lucky, or in a vacuum furnace which has a low oxygen pressure pressure. So oxygen is the key all the time. So we have to this this furnace is good for keeping oxygen out of stuff. So I, do I dare tell you a story about that one? So some kid was using that one time and it. it so it, it's made up, it's a metal chamber, and the metal chamber has to be cooled, otherwise it melts. So you can actually melt that thing. If, if the water turns off, then you can actually melt this, and if you melt it, you might, might blow up the end of the building. Well, <laughs> but the building didn't blow up, luckily, somehow. But that was only a matter of luck. This, this, this little thing right here is the highest temperature we have in our lab. This is called an arc melter. This is a, a arc, this is a, a welder's power supply. So you see, I think you can see those in New York where you somebody drives up with a truck. They have these things in the back of the truck, and they put a lot of electricity through a small arc. There's there's a little chamber right there, and they've got a tungsten tungsten rod that comes down. You actually can melt tungsten that thing. Do you know what the melting point of tungsten is? Three thousand degrees centigrade. It's unbelievably hot. So 
you can actually make things really, really hot and warm. What I want to show you is this next one. So the coolest hot thing in our lab is this. This is called a floating zone crystal growth furnace. So while we're making quantum materials nowadays, we use this a lot. You'll see some other crystals that are grown by this thing. Basically, it, it melts stuff by taking halogen lamps and putting them in elliptical mirrors. So you have a halogen bulb at one focus of an elliptical mirror, and it focuses the light to some distance away from the mirror. And then you line up four of these things, so all four of the bulbs that are in there concentrate their light in one spot. So that, that's a tricky business. So basically, you have to get the, the mirrors to all line up so that they all put their heat in a small area, and then the material has to absorb the light, so that's, 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 you have to have something that absorbs the light. And then, there's a picture one right there. Then the zone, the molten zone. So if you melt things at 2,000 degrees, they, they're not, that's not pretty, okay? They react with almost everything on Earth. So if you want to make something that doesn't react with the, the liquid at 2,000 degrees, the best thing to do is to have the liquid in contact with itself. It's something of the same composition. So this, this floating zone furnace is designed with that in mind, so that the, um, the melt is only in contact with a, a pencil-shaped rod that you can see up there, that is the same composition as it, and that is the image of the of the fur of the light of the lamp in the furnace right there. See those funny-shaped white things? That's the furnace bulbs that are imaged. So basically, heat is something we deal with all the time, and you can't be weak of spirit just like you can't be weak of spirit to walk around New York City. But basically, the kids have to figure out how to use that thing and focus the light in one spot and then get, get that little thing to hang there by capillary reaction. See, that's a little molten zone there. It's only, like, it's only like four or five millimeters in height. It has to stick there. Think about, think about that for a minute. You have a melt. It has to be in contact with itself. and it has to not fall off. So it has to have the right viscosity so that it doesn't fall off. So you can't make it too hot. If the zone gets too hot, then the liquid just falls off. So you're used to like water, it doesn't stick to anything. So to, this is a tricky machine to use. This, this is our high pressure furnace. Let's see, is more that coming? Yeah. So this is our high pressure furnace. This thing is called Karma. There's a reason it's called Karma, which is that it's hard, it's impossible to get it to work. Basically, this is a, a million pound press and it's only seven feet tall. And each one of these, these uh, metal things right here weighs 12,000, this weighs a lot. Like weighs, this thing weighs as much as three cars stacked on their noses. So it only goes in one corner of the building. And it, that piston, there's a big piston up there, you can't quite see it. It pushes down with a million pounds of force on something that's embedded inside this thing. Maybe you'll see something in there. So, it, so it presses down and it also heats things at the same time. So again, it's water cooled. So that, that, that cylinder right there is water cooled. You can't see the water cooling from there, but you can see the stupid handle. If you ever go to the Smithsonian, you can see this thing in the Smithsonian. It, because it's a technology that's kind of rare, I guess, but those, those little doorknob handles are special. So basically this allows us to, to see what we can make under pressure in a chemical, chemically uh, qualitative, a chemically quantifiable amount. So you realize that if you, you take two diamonds and squeeze them together, you get the really, really high pressure. But the, the volume of that sample is really, really small. And once you, and so that's bad. This makes things of a particular volume, like the size of a pencil, pencil eraser that you can take out. So the way this works is, you put the pressure on, you heat it up, then you take the heat off, then you take the pressure off. So you can quench a material, a high pressure material to ambient temperature by not giving it enough KT energy to get to the thermodynamically stable state. And the trick there is to think of what chemical compounds might form something different under pressure than they do under ordinary conditions. So this, this, this thing allows a chemist to actually do that in enough quantity so you can take the stuff out and then characterize it when you're done when you're done making it. And so that that's a that's a, and that that little icon on there is supposed to make it work, right? 
and don't try, don't get, don't try to get the guy who runs this company to do anything. He's a pain in the neck. So <laughs> we eventually had to order some parts from Germany, and when they came, then he said, "Okay, I can make those for you." <laughs> yeah, but the first, first thousand pounds. Yeah. Okay, now we have another one. So this one I want to show you something else. So how does the Earth make beautiful crystals? Well, the Earth makes beautiful crystals by by dissolving stuff in water and heating the water to a couple hundred degrees inside a rock. So we have a we have a furnace for doing that. It's right there. So basically, that thing goes in a furnace. That furnace goes in a a, a container that's glass proof. So if you have water at four hundred degrees, I want you to imagine what water at four hundred degrees Centigrade is like. It's not pretty. Okay. So you have to have a way to contain the pressure of the water, which, so this is like an artificial rock. And then it goes in this thing, so that heats it up. So you can, you can uh, make hydrothermal things. So that barium, potassium, thulium, borate is made under pressure by, by precipitating it from a water solution. And uh, this is some crystals grown by, by vapor transport. I think maybe we won't so much vapor transport later. But this is bismuth tellurium selenide, which is a topological insulator. It's grown in this furnace right here. So you have to design the furnaces to get what you want. This is a sealed evacuated silver tube with something in it. This is the one organic thing that we do. Tetramethyl ammonium nickel chloride. We made iron, coal, and nickel. Tetramethyl ammonium is a, this is called a hybrid, hybrid material. Nickel chloride is obviously an organic, and tetramethyl ammonium is obviously organic. Those are the crystals that grow in the solution. This is Voldemort and Athena. So, so what's, what's the tool that salt state chemists use to tell what they meant? So in organic chemistry, it's like NMR or something like that. In salt state chemistry, it's what crystal did you grow? And the crystal that you grow, you detect the crystal that you grew typically by doing the diffraction experiment. So we do a lot of diffraction, and that's what we're experts at. So interpreting a diffraction pattern is what we do. And if that, that one is a, a powder x-ray diffractometer. And the, you can see that the students who, who named this one, because it replaced Voldemort is the name of the old one, because it's the god of death. Okay, but now they change it to the goddess of light, or Athena, whatever she is. So, so it's that. And this is our this is our magnetometer. Got a snowy day out there. Yeah. So this must be a couple of years ago. Again, snow this year. Do you have snow in New York City yet? Not really. What are like? So that's our magnetometer. And the good news about us is that it's a new chemistry building, which I had a lot to put we were putting together. And they drill a hole in the floor so that the noise is all in the basement where we don't live. And you guys are lucky because you have the noise in your own labs. Here are some happy students. So what, what do we make? We make, so my latest, if you ask me what my favorite thing is, I think it's what I'm working on now. And so I, I really like uh, qubits and things like that, which I'm working on with the engineering student, the engineering professors and their students. And then there's topological insulators, which was the thing before this. Those are materials that are semiconductors that have a bizarre chemical characteristic, which is that the metal states go below the non-metal states in energy for certain spots, for certain wave, electron wave vectors. So that's, that's a real, I think that's an easy one to think of chemically. And so the surface of topological, the bulk may be insulating, but the metal, but the surface itself is metallic. So that's a bizarre thing. And that bismuth fluorium selenide is the leader in that field, the one who leads that field. And that's, that's good. And, uh, but I think it was like that was a hot field in 2010 or 2008, so those are old. So if you want to work with me on topological insulators, first of all, you have to convince me that they're interesting. Then you have to convince me that, that uh, that's a really a new one. Uh, quantum spin liquids. So quantum spin liquids, which we'll see something about if I keep going is a state of matter where you, you, you cool down to really low temperature and the excitations are quantum mechanical in the way. So you take, a, and the trick to that chemically is a, a low spin. So if you have a high spin, if you have a high number of unpaired electrons, you can 
you can explain the magnetism typically by classical, what we call classical physics. If you have a small number, if you have a small number of unpaired electrons, the effective mm -hmm. moment is lower, and then you have to worry about how the energy can be explained by a Hamiltonian instead of a classical. So, if some of my, my students are not miserable, um, find a new hybrid organic and organic magnet, and then find me a new way to make something. So that's a little tricky because you can't you can't tell what I think is interesting until you talk to me. So. <laughs> My field for, for the last 20, what, what year is it now? 2023. So, 1986, what the hell? Like 37 years or 38 years? It's been superconductivity. So, superconductivity, is, a lot of materials display this at low temperature, but there are different mechanisms why it can happen. And basically, it's basically the coupling of the electrons to something in the crystal structure or themselves that make the resistance of a material drop to zero at low temperature. So you have a normal metal at ordinary temperatures, but when you cool it, the resistance becomes exactly zero. And there's a lot of promises about that. But I like this picture because this is obviously a sumo wrestler must weigh a lot. And this is a sumo wrestler being levitated on some yttrium barium copper oxide, which is something I had a lot to do with back in the 1980s. And so there's, there's that. So it's good for the repulsion, the magnetic field of a superconductor repels other magnetic fields. So you can levitate, you can levitate a sumo wrestler on it, you can make a wire out of it, but this is from the 90s, this picture, and so the world has not changed because of superconductors at this moment, but there's always hope that you're going to be the one who invents the one that changes everything. I think that's the important part of life is having hope. So. So amongst the ways to get superconductors is to get something that's electronically unstable and get it to get it to do superconductivity instead of what it really wanted to do. And there are some states that are believed to give rise to superconductivity when they're destabilized. And the copper oxide superconductors, like you just saw, are one example of that because they're magnets under ordinary conditions, they're antiferromagnets, meaning the spins are aligned opposite. When you kill the antiferromagnetism, Superconductivity evolves. The other, the other state that you can is been proven to yield superconductivity is a charge density wave. So a charge density wave is a spontaneous arrangement of the conduction electrons in a, in a metal so that they they cluster, they make clusters, and then they they become insulating at low temperature. That's called the charge density wave. And it's the interaction between the electrons that does that. And so you take something like TaS two. Which is a known, a known uh, charge density wave material, and you change the electron count by putting, by putting in this case, you put copper between the layers, so it's a layered, called a layered dichalcotride. So it's, it makes a layered substance. So the electrons are confined to be in layers. You tail them right there, and then if you put copper in between the layers, you get the copper to give up its charge. So the copper. Donates an electron to the tampon disulfide layer. When it does that, you can suppress the charge density wave and eventually get superconductivity. So, this is a, what we call a superconducting dome in the world, which is that as you suppress the normal state of the electrons, you can get superconductivity to appear in, in a lot of cases, in some cases, by, by, by doping. So, Getting, putting an atom in there that's going to give up its electrons for the rest of the crystals. It's an interesting point. So copper in between, like at 0.04 coppers per tantalum, think about what that copper layer is. I mean, it's only 4% of the holes are filled with copper. So they're far apart. So it's not a copper-copper conductor. The copper has donated its electrons to the tantalum disulfide layer. And that, that donated electron that's gone in there has yielded superconductivity. So that's suppressed the charge density wave and give a rise to superconductivity. So basically, the spontaneous ordering of the electron has been disrupted by changing the electron count. After disrupting, you got a charge, you got a superconductor. This is just how you measure the superconductivity. So superconductivity has a variety of different features. One is which it expels magnetic fields, which you saw sumo wrestler standing on 
and superconductors. So we can measure that. That's from the one corner there. And then, of course, the characteristic of a superconductor is that the resistance drops to zero. That turns out to not be such a good measure because you can't really tell me where zero actually is. But, you, but, but this flux expulsion, you can actually measure the flux expulsion pretty easily. So, so we, we need to measure that all. How does introducing uh, an impurity like copper induce, it, does it still um, induce superconductivity by the Cooper pair mechanism? Right, so in this case, there are pairs of electrons in the superconductor, but, but what holds them together is the impurity. So I guess that this one could be an Are you asking, is it a collect, is it an electron phonon coupled superconductor? Yes. I think so. But, but I. Did anybody bother to prove that? I don't know. So, so if you get it, so um, back in 1956, after the discovery of superconductivity and mercury and all those, that was 1911 or something like that. So it took 50 years or something for somebody to figure out why superconductors happen at all. How is it that you can get a pair of electrons to have the same charge to couple to each other? Well, that's that's what the BCS theory is all about. How do you get them to, to Things that have the same charge to form a dimer. And it's, the, the idea is that they couple to each other through the lattice. And so that's called the BCS theory of superconductivity. And mostly that explains a lot of simple superconductivity, but it doesn't explain every single superconductor. So I think you can you can try to explain it, but you're not going to explain everything. Mm. I hate that. That's that's so I think that I mentioned that uh, hydrogen under pressure is supposed to be superconducting at room temperature or something like that. Well, that's because I, I always think that that's because it's comfortable to believe that. So you're a scientist, right? You want to live comfortably, right? So you want to think you understand everything, but you don't. Okay, you have to always. Here's another. Here's another simple concept that where the idea came from theorists. So basically. I guess the BCS theory is, is invented by theorists, and, but superconductivity was observed first. This whole thing about electron phonon, about suppressing charge density waves, yeah, that's kind of a theoretical argument, but this, this one is clearly theoretical. So if you take, who's, who prevents you from making elect, electrons or uh, atoms of unpaired electrons and putting them on a lattice of different, si different kinds? Nobody prevents you from doing that. So, if you have them on squares, they may form an ordered state. So basically, you have an electron in a d orbital on a metal, and it, it has a overlap with a p orbital of some non-metal in between, and then so that lines up the spins in opposite directions of the kit of the same quantum number. And then the, the the electron on the other side of the p orbital has to have a different spin, and then has to couple to another metal so on a square. You can get things that are aligned opposite just for that mechanism by right? super exchange. But it doesn't work on a triangle. So if you put two electrons on triangle, you put unpaired electrons on triangles, it can't work. So you can't have spins that are the opposite direction on triangles. So you can't take a substance that has unpaired electrons, put the unpaired electrons on a triangular lattice, and then have them order at low temperature into an ordered state. It just doesn't work. So you have to get some kind of compromise. What happens is you get a compromise state, which is either all spins out or all, or all spins in or something like that. You get things that are different chirality. So you get a mixture of spins pointing in the same direction and spins pointing in opposite direction. So eventually when you get down to zero Kelvin, most things will order, but they do that in a bizarre way. So they lose, they have to, you get, what is zero Kelvin after all? That means you have no entropy left, you think anyway. And if you have the spins randomly arranged, you should have some entropy left. So at zero Kelvin, they should order, or they should have some quantum mechanical fluctuation. So here's, here's a picture of, of uh, some lattices based on triangles. So, so in the world, you have uh, triangular lattices, which are easy. You put atoms on triangles, you just put the triangles together like that. That's a Kagame. That's called a Kagame lattice, that one right there, because it's a kind of Japanese basket weaving. So here's a Kagame basket. 
Notice the Kagame basket looks like a Jewish star, but basically it's, it's a set of triangles that share corners with each other. So how does that order at low temperature? How can I make a Kagame lattice and the spins order at low temperature? So basically this is where mineralogy came into the picture. So basically, I, I guess, they're coming on the next slide, but basically there's a Kagame basket. So there's a Kagame lattice. So that's the corner sharing triangles. This is edge sharing triangle, triangles. If you decorate the, the vertices of these lattices with another vert, with another spin, you can get another kind of lattice where it's three dimensional now. In the three dimensional lattice, this one in particular is interesting. This is called a pyrochlor lattice. So pyrochlor is a kind of mineral, which basically you take every triangle and you decorate the top of the triangle with another vertex that's equally distant to the other three. And then you get a pyramid. So the pyramid is also geometrically frustrated. So being knowledgeable in, in mineralogy, I knew that that um, the, the ferrite, that, that, that that kind of frustration is observed in a ferrite where you put chromium on areas, SCG on Strontium gallium chromium 9092. So there's a Kagame net of chromiums, and it's basically that's a gallium gallium lattice in between. There's a chromium in between there, but look at that. So that's like a vertex. That's like a Kagame net that's decorated with a vertex on each magnetic vertex or chromium. Chromium is interesting because chromium is D3, which means it has no orbital preference. So D3. Chromium three plus is always chromium is typically always three plus on a solid because that half filled T two G orbital is extremely stable. So, so if you make chromium compounds, are typically chromium three plus because they end up with three electrons on each of the T two G orbitals. So it's called an isotropic spin, which means that there's no spin anisotropy to favor one of those configurations over any other one. So that's Particularly geometrically frustrating. I knew from a mineral, from mineralogy, that that that, that thing that's called an M-type ferrite and spinel is called ferrite, and that there are different kinds of ferrites. One is called an R-type ferrite. One is called a QS ferrite, and that those are typically made with iron in the world. But I thought that maybe you can make them with chromium, so I asked students to try make them with chromium, and they worked. So we got the QS ferrite and R-type ferrites based on the fact that I knew and understood about mineralogy and that you can make this mineral with iron in it in things that are related to M-type ferrite. That explain that right? So basically there are different kinds of ferrites that have different kinds of layers in them and that typically iron makes almost every everything on earth because there's a lot of iron compounds on earth, a lot of iron oxides. But basically if you can do it with chromium, you can put an isotropic spin in this lattice. Put isotropic spin on this lattice, and you can make you can make this is a Kagame net of chromiums right here. And as I showed you, Kagames are based on triangles, and and uh, pyrochlor is based on triangles. So that's a good thing. And so you can actually do it. So that's a combination of physics and mineralogy to do that. The next thing we'll talk about is pyrochlors. So what I like about this project is that three different theorists. And those are pictures right there said to me on different occasions, Bob, can't you make us a can't you make us a pyrochlor with where that with, with where the magnetic interaction temperature is higher than one Kelvin? So most pyrochlors are based on rare earth elements. The rare earth elements, the unpaired electrons are in F orbitals. F orbitals are close to the nucleus. So those electrons are close to the nuclei, so they hardly interact with other <laughs> electrons. So you can make a Kagame net with F with rare earths. But because the unpaired spins are in F, in F orbitals, that means that they're far from each other, which means they interact weakly with each other. And weak interactions give you weak, give you low temperature magnetism. Oh, and, sorry, what is pyro? Is it some spontaneous electric field or whatever? So pyro you know, means what here? Pyro must mean a pyrochlor. I think when you heat, you heat a you heat the mineral, some minerals up, they give off chlorine. So I think pyrochlor got, the, got that name because 
it's A2B2O6X. And the X, it can be chlorine sometimes. And if you heat it up, the chlorine comes off. It's chlorine gas. And then, so pyrochlor means pyro heat. Pyro means heat. And chlor means chlorine. So I think that's how it got its name. So basically, it's a crystal structure type. I was just going to ask, are they characterized by a crystal structure? Like a specific crystal structure? Yeah, for all so basically, course. what I didn't explain too well is that pyrochlor is a particular structure type. So in the world, you exp we think of crystal structure types. So pyrochlor is the actual mineral, but pyrochlor structure type is A2B206 with an extra vertex. And the extra vertex allows you, there's something very peculiar about the pyrochlor structure, by the way, which is that not only is the rare earth lattice in the pyrochlor structure got a lattice of decorated, decorated um, tagamine, that's where you put an extra vertex, a magnetic vertex there, but also the non-magnetic thing is also also, also, also corner sharing entry major. So the pyrochlor structure is very special. It's made of two interpenetrating tetragonal lattices sharing corner, sharing corners with each other. So that is a peculiar mineral. And I think if you're a mineralogist, maybe you don't care about that. You just care that if I heat it up, I get chlorine out of it or God knows what, what they care about. But basically, in materials physics, it's a famous structure type because we make them with rare earths, and rare earths have different numbers of F electrons in them. So rare earths, which is at the bottom of the periodic table, can have one, two, three, up to 13 unpaired electrons in them, depending on where those electrons are in the F orbitals, make different kinds of magnitude. So, so the rare earth pyrochlorus are really important, and basically, the main point about rare earth pyrochlorus is that they are made with rare earths, which are have a three plus oxidation state. And this one needs to have no no electrons in it. This is the so this is the big atom site. This is the tetric, this is the octahedron site, which is, has to have no spin, and then there has to be seven oxygens. But the problem is, of course, that if you want to make that with something that has a bigger spin, now I have to go from F electrons, which are near the nucleus, to D electrons, which are further out. So if the D electrons are further from the nucleus, they're going to interact with each other more strongly. So you want to make the pyrochlor lattice is a particularly good lattice for frustration because it's made of interpenetrating tetrahedra. So if I can put something with D electrons in the, in the lattice interpenetrating tetrahedra, I can get it to work. So I want, unfortunately, or for, unfortunately, if I want to have unpaired spins I can't have a, I can't, this thing has, titanium four plus has no spin. So, so basically your TiO2, which you use every day in your life is titanium four plus. It gave up all its T electrons to oxygen and it's, it's white. So you use it in paint all the time. So this is probably TiO2 everywhere. Right? Good not to be allergic to TiO2. So anyway, there it is. And so TiO2 is not magnetic. So, so all the magnetism comes to the rare earth. This is dysprosium. So in order to balance the charge here, if I have to put a, a D electron thing here, I have to have only one and a half charges on this site, which means I have to have a mixture of A and a one plus and a two plus atom on that site. I have to put fluorine here instead of oxygen. So this is a little tricky to do. So I have to make a fluoride pyrochlor instead of an oxide pyrochlor. And the world likes to make oxides but it doesn't like to make fluorides. The reason it doesn't like to make fluorides is that fluorine is just don't make, don't make fluorides, okay? Because fluorine, like, if you heat a fluoride up in the air, you're going to get an oxide. This kid, so Jason was my, my genius kid. He, he, even though everybody told him, don't, don't do this, Jason, it's too stupid. He said, okay, I can do it. So Jason made, Jason made single crystals of fluoride pyrochlorides and Basically, to get the A site oxidation state right, you have to mix sodium and calcium, but then you get, you get cobalt and nickel. And cobalt, cobalt, you'll see as time goes on, is my, one of my favorite elements in the periodic table. Nickel, nickel is uh, 3D8. So it's got six electrons in T2G orbitals and then two electrons in EG orbitals. And so it, it's kind of got an isotropic spin, it was isotropic spin one. So nickel is interesting. 
what I like about this a lot is that it obeys something called the cure Weistel. And, it, and so the way this works is that the slope of this line in 1 over chi versus t tells you what the magnetic moment is. And the intercept of that line tells you what the strength of the magnetic interactions are. You can see it's like the intercept of that line is like 129 degrees negative. So the spins are very strongly interacting and they're not magnetically ordering down to low temperature. So nothing happens in this until 1 50th of the expected ordering temperature. So the, the spins are really, really frustrated in this foreign particle. So that was a good, so basically what the theorist asked me to do was to make something that where this number was more than one. So now I have 129. So that's pretty good. So the good news is that it made that. The bad news is that cobalt, cobalt in this thing is spin three halves. So you can see why I like cobalt so much for a minute. So that was this. So basically, cobalt, cobalt three plus. There's a very famous cobalt compound in salt lake chemistry. Maybe it's cobalt, the famous in physics. It's LaCoO three, where cobalt undergoes a. It's cobalt three plus, so it's D six cobalt. So at high temperature, the it's in a high spin state, meaning that the, the not that those six D electrons. Right there, right there, draw. At the right way. So basically, you don't know this, but basically, if you put something in an octahedron, these are the T2G orbitals. These are the ones that stick out between between the ligands. These ones point to the ligands. This is T Z squared. This is X squared minus Y squared. This is X Y X Z Y Z. So these, these orbitals point between the ligands of the octahedron. This one points, these two point at it. So because they point at it, and electrons in those orbitals will repel, be repelled by the electrons in the orbitals of the ligands surrounding it, they have a higher energy. So, so cobalt 3 plus is famous because it goes from this, six electrons at high temperature does that, and at low temperature does this. So basically, cobalt undergoes a spin state transition on cooling cobalt 3 plus to something that's got a filled T2Gs at low temperature to something that's got lots of unpaired electrons at high temperature. So, so cobalt 3 plus is very famous. So there's one substance that does that in the world. And I think the thing that bothers me about cobalt is every cobalt compound ever known has been interpreted as being that way or this high spin. So if you have cobalt 2 plus, that means it, it gave up one fewer electron. Sure people can see. So it can be that, if it's low spin, or it can be this. Oops. So basically, Oh, well, two plus can be. But basically, cobalt two plus, and also, it always bothers me that this, you see, spin three halves, which this is a half, that's a half, that's a half. So every compound known to humanity before was spin three halves cobalt or cobalt two plus. But why doesn't it do that? Why doesn't it go to some low spin state by cooling? So why doesn't it do that when you cool it? Why does it go from three halves to one half? So I don't understand that. So I've been having my students look for cobalt half. So if you want to find a cobalt a half, cobalt with one unpaired spin, that's going to be a spin a half. Spin a half is like a quantum spin. So now the temperature, the behavior of this. Thing at low temperature can't be explained simply by might not be explained by a simple classical picture of how it spins into that. So you might not get that, you might get some entanglement. So long distance communication of spins, which would be good for a quantum. So we would like to make cobalt cobalt two plus low spin. So how do you do that? 
by the way. So now we're going to talk about another lattice that's related to triangles, but not quite the triangle. The reason this is a popular one amongst physicists is that somebody solved, some mathematician named Kitty, a Russian mathematician, actually solved a set of equations that describe exactly how a honeycomb lattice should order at low temperature. So when you get rid of the, you put a spin on a honeycomb lattice, you can solve the Hamiltonian for that thing and tell, tell exactly how the spin should order. And what, what I like about honeycomb lattices is, look at that guy right there. He has three opposite neighbors there, and then six, six that are, if this, is, if this black one is opposite to that one, then this one is opposite, opposite to the black, which means it's the same as that. So it's got three of these neighbors, three of the opposite kind, and six of the same kind. So it has, so the, the balance of that is, is if that six, six times a smaller number is equal to three times a big number, then it's going to have what's called, it's not going to know exactly what to do. So I guess, even if it doesn't form this exact state that Kitty have solved, Honeycomb mass is really interesting. And I think um, there was a, it's good to be the first physicist to think of this. So ruthenium trichloride, which I showed you crystals of before, the grow crystals crystals of ruthenium trichloride, and it, it seems to order, have a regular magnetic ordering at low temperature, but then when you, when you uh, put a magnetic field on it, you can make the regular ordering go away. And at eight Tesla, or 10 Tesla, which is, 10 times 10 to the fourth Orsteds, the Earth's field is one half an Orsted, right? You can get it to, you can get, you can change the uh, interactions between the magnetic moments so that it becomes something and no one knows what it is. They think it's a quantum spin liquid. So the good news is the theum trichloride is the first one to do that. The bad news is the field is really high. So I started bugging my students to make honeycombs out of cobalt. And fortunately, I had a, this, this, she's an, a, a, let's say assertive is a nice way to put it, an aggressive person who wanted to make a name for herself. She's back in China now. She's an nice lady, but she was impossible. And she grew crystals of ruthenium, barium, cobalt, arsenic. And it has a honeycomb lattice of cobalts. And by some miracle, the cobalts are, are low spin in that one. So, so basically, you're able to make a honeycomb lattice with spin a half cobalt on it. And then look at the look at the behavior of that thing as a function of temperature and magnetic field. And just like the barium, oh then so then I went to the um, the physicist who went around that who lived around work around me, one was on, and he measured the thermal conductivity of stuff. He showed this rather dramatic drop in thermal conductivity as you as you put a magnetic field on. Well, so what what does thermal conductivity come from in the solid? Well, it comes from the electrons moving around, it comes from lattice vibration, it comes from uh, magnetic excitation. So this says that the magnetic excitation dramatically changed at a half a, half a tesla by 0.5 tesla, which is a nice successful magnetic field. Something happened. And then when you do magnetization versus applied field, you can see that the behavior is really peculiar. So there are these steps in the magnetization as you put the field of different values on it. So this, this is like the magic stuff. So basically, you have the arsenic oxygen tetrahedron and the barium, which put the cobalt just the right spacing apart so that you get what looks like low spin cobalt two plus. And you get this, you get the same thing that you get in ruthenium trichloride, but you get it at a 0.5 Tesla, which is accessible at neutron scattering experiment. Have you ever done a neutron scattering experiment? You know, it's hard to get a field that big on something as big as you need to do a neutron diffraction experiment. So to do a neutron diffraction, which is very sensitive to magnetic excitations, you have to, you have to put something in a field of less than two tesla, one and a half tesla, something like that. So the problem with ruthenium chloride is you need a field that's much, much bigger than that. This one you can actually do it. So thankfully for me, that turns out to be controversial. So I could Make that diagram and say it should, should be a quantum spin liquid up there. But some, now, that, now there are two experiments, some of which say it is, some of which say it isn't, which I think is perfect. 
And every time it happens, I saw the fight, which is perfect for me. What does the K mean? K says KSL. Kitty of quantum. Kitty of it. Kitty of is the mathematician. So the end of the story is this. So if you want to find new, so a big thing for condensed matter physicists nowadays is to find new physics. Because condensed matter systems can be different from what you get when you do high energy physics or whatever you all do. So you can get something different. And all you have to do, well, not all you have to do, you have to be, the way I look at my role is to, to, to look around the periodic table, see if I see something interesting, and try and sell that to the physics characters, see if they'll measure something, right? And if they measure something, they might find something good. So we just need to know what to make. And the information about what to make for my, my career has always come from physicists. And the thing you'll discover about me is I'm not ashamed of the fact that I don't understand physics. You can ask me what a kitty of quantum spin liquid is or how to solve an equation. I can't do it. And I don't care because that guy can't come up with barium cobalt oxygen. <laughs> so, so there we go. So there we so, so and I've never been sad about that. And the other thing is everything takes time. So nothing, nothing happens fast. So you may be in a hurry to do what you want to do, but to really get something, it takes time to do it. And that thing, that's just, the other thing is, no guts, no glory. That's why I tell my kids all the time. Not only do they have to kick butt, but no guts, no glory. So if they don't try crazy stuff, they can't get a crazy answer. If you can't try something that's not supposed to work, how are you supposed to do, dis discover something? So that's, that's not thing I like to talk about, but basically, oh. The other thing, the final thing is, read everything in the, read, you're taking some class and some, some professors are going to be just up there going blah, 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 and you're not going to understand what they're talking about, or you don't care about what they're talking about. You should care about all of it. So you never know what life is going to, where life is going to bring you. So I, all the stuff I thought was boring in school turned out to be important to me later in life. So <laughs> those guys knew what they were talking about. You know, I didn't think of what they were talking about. But, you know, was, so just listen to it. Right. So, it's a talk now. Some questions? I still haven't told us how you do it. Uh, I mean, I, it seems like a miracle. You, you, somebody says, make a quantum spin liquid, and you somehow come up with materials that have the right Symmetries and so, so on. How does it work? Basically, I think a solid state chemist spends a lot of time just staring at pictures of crystal structures and just imagining where the where the electron might be. So basically, I show you the ones that work, but lots of the ones are just normal. So and when it doesn't work, you just don't get a crystal, or you, you just don't don't publish anything. Let me ask you a question: Have you ever thought or found like a Material that mimics the physics of a spin glass. Like a spin glass? Spin glass, yeah. Mm. Like something that yeah. is like a, not inherently paramagnetic but strongly diamagnetic. Yeah. So. Uh, spin glasses. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they exist. <laughs> but I mean, they, yeah. in principle, theoretically, you can build it, right? You can yeah, like a lot of anti ferromagnetic and ferromagnetic. So particles. basically, <laughs> I don't know how, how low if you want the magnetization to go, we'll have to the spin glass one. Well, the zero. Zero? <laughs> yeah. I don't think I ever saw one like that. But I mean, even, even yeah, it's more magnetization fine, yeah. Would that be interesting? Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. Like mixed space, yeah. Well, I'm happy to try to find it. Ten years from now, you may see something that has got zero magnetization. Yeah. Does it have to be like a low spin for that to work? Um, not really. No, no. It'd be even nice. Spin glasses are a diamond, doesn't it? Actually, it's, if, 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 if I spin it's even better. Just they don't have to. I mean, so basically, to dice. <laughs> disorder is common in solids. Mm -hmm. So you want to, making something ordered is harder than making something disordered. So a spin, a, a glassy magnetic system should be possible to make. Yeah, let's say it should be something that is locally magnetized, but globally, I mean, you can see the magnetization. There's a point in the chat right now. Well, there's a question in the chat. Yeah, there it is. 
You can see what the question is. <laughs> Nothing. There's, there's two parts to working. One part is to actually doing it, and the other part is thinking of something to do. And sometimes you can't tell when the ideas are going to come to you or what to do next, right? They just come. That was wrong. So if you ask me how I know how to put the atoms together in the periodic table, it's by looking at staring at papers that people did in the 1960s and 70s, and just being able to find those things, mm -hmm. and then matching what it could be like to put something odd on it. It's, it's a bit, it's, it's knowing about meteorology has been extremely helpful. Oh, actually, let me ask kind of more, one more question. So have you found the material that has a re-entrant phase? So basically, it is paramagnetic, then ferromagnetic, and then paramagnetic again upon cooling. No? Oh, no. Good. So a re-entrant paramagnetic. Yes. Because I, I, mean, I have a model that does that. Re <laughs> the the re-entrant superconductors. The re-entrant superconductors, but they're not re -entrant. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Some, but yeah, it is actually becoming superconducting again. So, no. so I think that homium nickel boron carbide is a reentrant superconductor. It does superconducting, then the homium spins in order and becomes normal again. And then, uh, uh, when the homium spins get before they order, it it's, gets normal. Then when they order, it gets superconducting again. That's not what you asked. You asked for spring, spring last and normal. Oh okay, yeah, that, 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 that is one thing, but even a re-entrant paramagnetic phase. Re paramagnetic. Yeah. I don't know. But in a few years you might. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of years ago. No, any further questions? Thank you so much for I Uh, Bob, I had a question. Oh, Paul. Paul we Hi, didn't Paul. see you. Sorry. <laughs> we didn't see you. Hi, Paul. How are you? Okay. That was cool. Um, yeah, my question is, as always, how do you do this stuff, which is what was already asked? It seems that you have a set of rules that aren't rules that I've heard before, you know, from chemistry, um, which guide you. You know, so if you want to get bigger interactions or smaller interactions, you know which way to go, which elements to use, stuff like that. Where does this come from? Do you have a, a table like what you showed in the beginning with Pauling's, with Pauling electronegativity, with Kava, you know, something or another? No. Periodic no. table that you can look to and find out what, if it's, you it's use the these things, table. things work? It's just like experience that tells you which which elements in the periodic table do what when they're coordinated to what other ligands so basically this is a lifetime question i think for me that's a big thing that's happening in the world nowadays we're trying to teach what's called machine learning do you have that in your fields too where you, you try to teach a machine how to notice what you notice and you know how you do it i guess the machine notices what you tell it to notice so you had that the idea in the first thing. But still, but still, your intuition somehow should be uh, written down or yeah. something. <laughs> One other thing, you said everything takes a long time. Why BCO didn't take you so long? Well, yeah, well, why didn't it take me so long? Because I knew they had to be different. No, uh, it didn't. I said, I said it didn't take you so long. It didn't. Right? So I kind of like BCO. So basically... Like that because I knew the elements had to be different. So it was yttrium, barium, copper, and oxygen. I knew they all had to be different. So that they were kind of a simple ratio. So that was four samples later, it was done. So that was good. Just a good guess. Okay. Okay. You got good at guessing. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Can't, can't you've, been, you've been lucky a lot. <laughs> lucky a lot. Lucky a lot. Lucky a lot. Lucky a lot. Thanks for the questions. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Paul. We'll look forward to seeing you back here soon. Hope so. Thanks for saying this.